admire only few know hippocrates the most renowned nuclear physicist mathematician and activist his research career extensively focuses on quantum field theory particle phenomenology supersymmetry and abstract algebra in particle physics he has his phd from mit university and has made many noble and important contributions in particle physics particularly his ground breaking books and articles tend to drive a revolution in our society and his innovative thinking his resoluteness is outlandish his prevalent ideas are a driving force in the inspirational and aspirational minds of young intellectuals like myself i am honored to be today with the one and only my mentor dr parvez hudbai so sir uh, before starting the interview assalam alaikum can i say something yes sir of course you have described me in terms that make me very uncomfortable because my work is not ground breaking i am an ordinary physicist i worked hard i am okay with what i did but please don't say that i changed the world with my work in physics or in anything else so let's be very modest let's be factual and let's stick to the truth proof that he is down to earth acha so sir uh, in relation to the interview my first question from you is what is your favorite equation oh i have no doubt about that you know for if i am to write it down uh maybe i can yes. maybe i can huh sure it's such a short sweet equation it is this little thing i d slash psi equals 0 this is what is called the dirac equation the dirac equation is the dirac equation for a particle which doesn't have mass and it's mm. the most beautiful equation because this describes the electron this describes the neutrino this actually describes so many different kinds of particles including quarks mm. and you see over here it has just got three symbols in it Mm. iota that's the square root of minus 1 there is okay what i've written over here d with a slash mm. it'll take me a while to explain that so i won't try and explain it and psi is the wave function or mm. rather it is what is called the spinner now this little equation has got so much complexity beauty simplicity and power it will tell you so many different things that i can't even go into that over here now thank you sir so my second question is is evolution random yes it is random but it is guided by principles so of course the basic fact is that nothing can violate the laws of physics so humans animals bacteria we are all subject to the laws of physics and those are uh, well you know newton's laws of uh, motion gravitation quantum mechanics general relativity etc but there is also a principle which um, probably doesn't come from these or it could i don't know we don't know as yet and that's the principle of natural selection so those species which are able to adapt to the environment they are the ones going to survive the others will die out so within those constraints evolution is random random but guided by principle yes sir so very well explained evolution uh, my third question is how does entropy define the arrow of time i think that's quite easily understood so suppose you take a a beaker of water and you drop um, ink into it so there's one drop of ink that you see going into the water what do you see happening chaos being created yeah what you see is that 
the drop then spreads out. Yes. Okay. Now, if you were to make a video of this, and if you were to run this backwards, would you be able to tell the difference? Of course you would, because you n always see a drop spreading out mm. and getting mixed into the body of the water. Yes. You never see the color by itself coalescing into a drop. So entropy is increasing as the color spreads out. The disorder increases as the drop spreads out. And so that gives you a unique direction for time. So, yes, entropy does give you the arrow of time. Entropy points in the direction of increasing disorder. And you know, look, I gave you the example of, uh, of this drop of ink. Um, I could have given you 20,000 other examples, uh, like, for example, um, the spreading of gases. When a gas is confined, it has lower entropy. When it's in a larger volume, it's got greater entropy, um, etc. Yes. Sir, uh, fourth question is a fantasy question, like not related to real life. Okay. So, Mike is a person who knows how to time travel, right? So, by creating the Alcubierre drive or by Einstein Rosenbridge's wormholes, he just assume he knows how to time travel. We are assuming it. Okay? But there are certain rules he must follow in order not to violate causality, which is the relationship between cause and effect. Right? So, first rule says he cannot convey any information to anyone in past or pre future related to his timeline. Second rule says he cannot re-rewind time. In such cases, there would be multiple copies of him in the same timeline. Then third rule says he cannot change any order of events, not to cause paradoxes like the one such as the grandfather paradox, let's say. Right? So, what are your views? Okay, is this kind of time travel really possible? Yeah, so I think uh, um, going back into the past mm. and influencing what happened in the past is something that is pretty much ruled out, mm. I think, yes. logically. So, the grandfather paradox that you refer to, it means that you go back in time and you kill your grandfather. grandfather exactly. Now, if you kill your grandfather, how can you, how be, can you be here? Yes. Huh? Um, or if you, you know, fiddle around, do something over there back in the past, then you influence what has happened today. Mm. The other point you mentioned was that, okay, I go, uh, I don't kill my grandfather, but I kill, um, let's say, Adolf Hitler. Mm. Mm. Then the um, history of the Second World War doesn't Changes. happen. Changes, yes. Which means that, well, you have um, yes. destroyed yes. the present. Yes. It's a different thing. And then the third point you mentioned was that you can make multiple copies of today. Yourself. Of In yourself. The same timeline. And today. Yes. What's, what's over here? We are here at the black hole. There, there's only one black hole in Islam. Yes. Right? There could be 50 black holes in Islam. Yes. Right? Wouldn't that be nice? Yes, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> and sir, one more thing. Ke not to convey, if I go in the past, tell someone, I know how to time travel. I'm Mike, right? Ke how to time travel. Then they might invent a time machine and then the order of time breaks again. Absolutely. So, is this kind of time travel possible? Yes or no? No. No. no, no. <laughs> However, you can go into the future. And yes, by the relativity. Yeah, so, um, you know, I forget the name of that film, the, the, the movie where they actually um, do this uh, thing. They go circle around a black hole, time slows down, 
and then they pop out into the fifth dimension, <laughs> through the fifth, fifth dimension, dimension into the present universe. That's a bit far-fetched, but far it's not uh, forbidden by the laws of physics, you know. Yes. So we can, and of course we know about the twin paradox, which is yes. something that we've investigated again and again, and maybe a billion times, because once you put a particle into motion, let's say circular motion, yes. its clock starts running slower. And so um, the observer on the ground versus the observer who's gone around, their clocks don't run at the same speed. And in this sense, you can go into the future, but you can't go into the past for the reasons that we talked about. Yes, yes, yes. So my understanding of time travel is elevated today. So my fifth question relates to the fact that we are using CRISPR technology to modify genes, right? So in the future, won't there be a problem to preserve your own DNA, to not let anyone change your DNA, to keep it in, in its purest form as clones can be created and uh, we would be vulnerable to a slow evolution as our population increases. For example, let's say, Today our uh, population is 8 billion. Today our evolution is quite slow as compared to let's say when it was 1 billion or 2 billion. Because traits travel faster when the, uh, when the population of a species is lower. Uh, I'm not sure about that. Uh, why? See, the genetic mutations happen at the same rate. Survivability in our situation doesn't have the same meaning as it had in earlier epochs. So I'm not sure about that. But let's talk about CRISPR. Yes. CRISPR. Yes, uh, yes. That's a means of genetic manipulation. It's not the only means. It's uh, faster. One of them. Yes. It's, it's faster than most. What you can do is you can pluck out uh, entire genes. So yes. the DNA molecule is very, very long, or you can break it up into pieces, you can select out one, you can change the CGAT, um, you, you know, those, those uh, links between yes, the molecules, uh, and that's a different gene over there. Very interesting, but also very dangerous stuff, and yes. I haven't really thought through about its implications. Yes, very right. So, sir, should we be worried about keeping our DNA in its purest form in the future? Well, my DNA is uh, not going to change during my lifetime. Now, if somebody fiddles around with it uh, and plucks out certain genes or puts others or does some kind of genetic mod modification, that does change my genes. Uh, but uh, by itself, it won't. So if um, you decide to preserve the genes of, um, let's say, 500,000 people today, or even more, you can do it. That's, that's not an issue. That can be done. Selective modification is, of course, possible. And that's what we talked about earlier. CRISPR is, is the sort of thing that can, you know, do a lot of um, good, but also a lot of bad. Exactly, exactly. Yes. So, 100% agree with you. So sir, the next question is, the danger lies in creating super bug viruses. Uh, like, uh, it is going to be more devastating than a nuclear war. It is going to be more devastating than a war over resources. Or it is going to be more devastating than the war with AI. This is a prediction, a notion that scientists are prevailing today. Ke the uh, next danger lies in creating superbug viruses. So we have made, why is this so, you might ask. So we have made viruses DNA open to research. For example, anyone can now extract or order online the DNA of COVID-19, coronavirus. So we have made it that, uh, that virus DNA more accessible to more people. And now they can conduct the research in their own backyard that they can make already dangerous viruses even more dangerous, even more destructive for the human race. 
so that are even immune to let's say third generation antibiotics so how can we prevent this is the first part and uh, second part is should we like make viruses more available the dna of virus is more available to the wider aspect well first of all i think uh, viruses are a plenty it's a um, matter of extracting them um there's uh, we we know that they come about uh, because certain strains somehow survive their environment we don't know exactly what happened with covid-19 mm, exactly uh, it is said to have emerged in wuhan province china. china it is alleged that it was manufactured yes as a weapon but uh, so far not proven i don't see any proof of yes. this there's a nobel prize winner who said that he doesn't believe that it's possible to make uh, to weaponize um a virus in this way it's far too difficult mm. but uh, if if um it becomes easier over time then mm. certainly this will be a very big danger we saw that it brought the world practically to a stop i mean covid-19 exactly. did and what happens if uh, some other still more resistant virus comes along or bacterium you know they, this is a virus but it could have been a bacteria, bacteria which also. which um, did this damage so look uh, when you ask me to compare this with the um, dangers of nuclear war i mm. i think that things like this are more probable but you can't really compare with nuclear war nuclear war would be so extremely devastating there'd be nothing left mm. uh also i don't think super bugs are as dangerous as climate change climate mm. change is a certainty it's happening before our very eyes climate change is going to affect every living species on earth whereas a super bug will get rid of you and me mm. yeah but then there'll be others who will survive who will survive i think climate change and nuclear war are more dangerous than super bugs yes. so yes my next question uh, is quite interesting and i have created it right now as a fact so it is said it is well researched that the dna of chimps and the dna of homo sapiens only have a difference of 1% of intelligence acha so this means that chimps have not made progress had not con- constructed buildings have not invented let's say the hubble telescope and they have not invented the particle accelerator so this all this big difference comes from 1% gene difference right so what if we were to extrapolate that difference 1% further that intelligence vector that would mean we would be traveling at light speed another species 1% more intelligent than homo sapiens yes that shows how far intelligence can take you it is also telling us that uh, when we collectively pool our intelligence so look uh, by himself einstein would have been nothing mm. Mm? it's only because of the physicists before, before. him that uh, so let's let's look at what he relied upon he relied upon the work of newton classical mechanics he relied upon the works of maxwell maxwell was maxwell. was um, electromagnetic theory he relied upon the works of boltzmann and uh, the works of thermodynamics and so forth so that is what enabled einstein to be so effective so now we as we use the works of others and as we become more effective in doing that we become at the same time more effective more creative more able to produce yes so looking at the future um because technology is giving us this 
opportunity of cooperation, of learning from others at a very, very fast pace. Mm -hmm. And now, because of that, we've been able to create artificial intelligence. And so therefore, humanity as a whole is now galloping ahead at an exponential speed. Yes. Yes. Where exponential means you keep doubling after uh, roughly uh, 2.7 uh, units <laughs> and so on. Yes, right. So, next question is, why can't you measure the speed of light according to relativity? Oh, I think we can measure the speed of light. I mean, we do it all the time. All you need to do is, you need to know the distance from here to here, send a light signal from here, and find how long it takes to bounce back. So, why do you say we can't measure the speed According of light? According to relativity, relativity ah, but this says I, so, we can't measure. Light speed is a constant, C, yeah. uh, Einstein. But still, there are uh, like suggestions that a lot of research that we can't measure the speed of light in let's say this is like simple classic thing that A to B we can't measure the time light takes to, from point A to B we can no 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 you're you're not getting my question <laughs> sir it is like a place a mirror it bounces back you yeah. would get the two-way speed of light not the one way you can never ever calculate or uh, you can say measure the speed of light one way trip that's what the point i'm making no you can um, i i think i think you can uh, einstein yeah. didn't forbid it in fact um, he tells you how to set up clocks and um, measuring rods throughout all of space and that's what we uh, teach students at the beginning of a course in special relativity. Mm. So I, I, I don't think that statement is right. I don't think it is, what you've said is correct. Okay. That's okay, yeah. that's okay. No, no, uh, I basically like uh, delve deep into it and what the author of the book was saying, okay, what if one way distance is the same speed as we say so but what if the other trip is in instantaneous like instant like no. we send light one way to mars we don't know we, we measure the two-way speed of light no it's, uh, you, you you can repeat the experiment at mars you'll get the same result okay, okay. right pretty fair so Next question, do you like imaginary numbers? Oh, I love them. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's one over here, that, yes. that, that iota over there. Why do I love these numbers? Because they are such crea they, they're creations of the human mind, mm. which have proved incredibly useful. Now, who would have thought that the square root of minus one uh, would, would be important? In fact, when you teach it in a class, you say, you ask students, did you enjoy it? They say, no, it, uh, it's useless. It's something that doesn't exist. But these, it's not. but you see, the point is that no number exists. All numbers are, are yes. figments of the mind. Ah, exactly, exactly. They are our mental creations, and yet they are so useful. And so that's why, I may not love them, I still respect them. Wonderful answer. So, sir, do you see Fritz Haber as one of the most controversial person in history of the mankind as he, as you said, told me before, that he invented uh, weapons, but I believe he was more into nitrogen. First, he get, did a good task. Then, he basically even you know, died from his own uh, research by the fact that he was creating a counterintuitive measure to remove the knock in, knocking in cars that he created a new uh, like fuel that can be used in cars that was uh, 
responsible for less knocking in car so in the process there was like kind of uh, you know like fumes that went into his body and he died oh i didn't know this all i know about fritz haber yes. was that he was a great uh, chemist uh, around the time of einstein so right. this was 1905 so the first part of the 20th century i also know that uh, he's the man who recommended to the german government in fact to the kaiser that um, germany should use chemical warfare mm -hmm. and he showed a way of manufacturing sarin gas s a r i n gas which was extremely lethal and um he said that this is a weapon that is so dreadful that it will end the war the german government they said sure let's go for it and when the germans first started using it then the allies responded and the whole thing became a mass of corpses the battlefields were strewn with dead people dead soldiers was he controversial sure i think that somebody you know if i could have killed him i would have <laughs> <laughs> okay i i i don't i may have liked the guy but he was so dangerous yes. i, I he, he deserved <laughs> to be shot exactly acha so this is the next question is i think one of the world's most pressing questions was there zero entropy at the time of big bang well uh this is i think a question that has different answers in different scenarios so if you say that the world was created in a single quantum state as um inflationary theory tells you then if there's only one quantum state if the universe has a wave function then it has zero entropy because then uh there's no uncertainty in the wave function itself classically you see that um heat um uh, that, that an isolated system has to increase its entropy but um as long as it stays in a single quantum state then no matter how that state evolves with time its entropy is zero right right okay great so sir i have observed that you are a non believer in the theory of multiverse you don't believe that there are many universes you only say that our universe is the only single universe that exists in the whole space time right so sir how do you how would you convince stephen hawkins or these kind of scientists if they were alive like who proved mathematically that multiple universe can exist on the basis of probability okay we are only living in a universe that has if you acha in simpler words if you throw a dice thousands of time like millions of time or billions of time you are meant to get the right conditions for life to exist in our universe right so all these other universes may be lifeless or they may have a slightly different copy of you and me so i Your think views. i i think that uh, every physicist small or big mm. considers this an open question because we cannot ever access those other universes we say that the the that inflationary theory gives this as a possibility and so until there's some uh, way of actually testing for the existence of other universes i'll say that this is a good hypothesis let it remain a hypothesis when somebody comes up with a better idea then we'll be in a position to either accept or reject it so yes i'm a non believer i'm a non believer in many things i say believe only that that you see that 
you can have proof for. Proof for. And if you don't have the proof today, it doesn't matter, but it should be provable, or rather I should say, By it should be disprovable. Ah. If it is disprovable, then it's a scientific theory. And this is what Karl Popper said, the principle of falsifiability. Very commendable observations, sir, I must say. Uh, achha, the next question also relates to future. Ke in which area will there be revolution in science and technology, according to you, in let's say 100 or 1000 years? Oh, 100 years is too far away for me to see, but in the next 5, 10 years? Uh, I think uh, biology is where the major changes are going to be happening, where we now are in a position to deal directly with genes and we are able to identify when certain genes express themselves and when they don't. That kind of research is going to be transformative. So the, it, it may not be cutting edge so far as theory is concerned, but it will be transformational. Great. Achha, why are philosophy and science closely linked? Mm -hmm. uh, that's always historically been the case. Earlier on, our knowledge of the physical universe was very limited, and so we had to resort to philosophy in order to understand the world around us. But now, we know that there are physical principles at work, yet we don't know what is behind those physical principles. So that's, of course, in our interpretation of the material universe. But there's also another aspect which I think is very different, and that's to do with uh, issues of ethics and morals mm. and what is right, what is wrong. And those questions become, well, very um, important now especially as at a time when machines will be making decisions for us, artificial intelligence, what that means. Here, the issue of philosophy, who are we, what is sentience? Uh, what is it that makes us different from a computer? If there is such a difference, we don't even know if there's a difference between you, me, and a computer. So those are things that philosophy will help us uh, resolve and the larger issues the largest issues will always belong to the domain of philosophy right right so what you're saying is okay, science is based on experimental logic and while philosophy is a uh, open like you can put any philosophical philosophical belief and then it, the science is used to test that belief it may not even be testable. But right, right. argumentation, um, learning from the past, um, gathering information in its multiple forms, mm -hmm. that's very important. That's that's philosophy. Yes, yeah. exactly. Right, right. So why is exploring the field of AI and uh, data structure algorithms very important? Well, uh, one, pragmatic reason is that um, machines are getting too complicated for us to handle. Now, if you have good AI, then you can get rid of a fighter pilot, for example. And in future, what we're going to have is fighter planes, the F-35s, the, even the ones after that, they will not need uh, humans oh to fly them. And uh, AI is going to be used even in your washing machine. It'll look to see how much the, the load, it'll look to see the, the quality of the fabric and then it'll spin more or less dep depending right, on that. Right. So it's got obvious technological... Achha, you know. Last question. Sir, what is your one wish that you're most willing to fulfill but it hasn't been fulfilled yet? Oh. Uh. I don't have to make a last wish, you know. I, no, it's not a last <laughs> wish. It's a wish ke, that you're most willing to fulfill, that you're most wanted to fulfill. 
but it hasn't been good. Well, um, I wish uh, we could have peace, we could have plenty, we could um, learn to respect nature, live with nature. Um, I wish all of us could become good human beings so that there would be no conflict. And so that's my last wish. Okay, great. So we are... Thank you, sir. Thank you for... And those were very good, very perceptive questions. Thank you. And uh, you are a remarkable young man. Thank you, sir. And I wish you all the best. You're going to go very far. Sir, thank you for keeping a ray of light alive in this orthodox and stereotypical society. Chal. We'll change it. Okay. We'll change it. Yeah. <laughs>